Hello everyone, welcome to the part 2 of lecture 5 of ECE 141. We're still going to be talking about digital modulation with memory, but in this lecture, we will be talking about the general case of your continuous phase frequency shift keying. And uh, recall that your frequency shift keying has a memory embedded in the phase of the signal. And depending on your modulation index H, uh, your uh, the number of states increase or decrease depending on that right so the the uh, point of interest for us here is when h is rational if it's irrational then you just have an infinite number of states and it's not a finite state machine anymore so we're only going to consider that case but this time how do we add memory in our continuous phase frequency shift key that's our continuous phase modulation and CPFSK is a special case of that. So collectively, our continuous phase modulation has a phase function of this form. Okay, so beta is again the integral of any pulse G of T. Okay. It's the integral of your G of T. And uh, your HK could actually also differ depending on the time step. And this is called the multi-H CPM. But we won't, be, uh, we won't be discussing that. So anyway, uh, your HK here should be constant across time. So uh, there are two types of your CPM depending on the response of your filter. Your full response would be the one that has a duration from on one symbol period, 0 to T. And this is your full response CPM and your rectangular pulse from CPFSK uh, is a full response CPM. If the duration of the pulse exceeds T, we call that a partial response. We're only going to limit this we're only going to limit our responses in integer numbers or integer multiples of t. So some full response pulse shape. This is your rectangular pulse. We call this the half cosine pulse, so hc. And the integral of which becomes this. It stays constant after time t. Same is true with our half cosine pulse. So it's constant at one half after time t. So if you're going to design the pulse shapes, make sure that the area, uh, the area of your pulse is always equal to one half. So even if you have uh, a partial response pulse shape, your uh, sim your response rather exceeds t, and it's an integer multiple of t. Make sure that the area is still one half, such that after two t, in this case, the pulse ends at one half when integrated. Right. So any type of pulse. And some popular pulse shapes we call this L rec, an L rectangular pulse, L raised cosine pulse, R C where L being the length of the pulse. So as you can see here, we have L in the factor. L creates or L decides the length of the pulse, etc., etc. And we have what we call the Gaussian minimum shift keying, where we have two parameters, Bt. Okay. And uh, Bt is called time bandwidth product. So note that GMSK is actually used in our cell phone. So, uh, if you're familiar with this GSM, uh, this is a standard that was used and is actually still currently in use by our cell phones. Right? So that's a 2G standard and it uses Gaussian minimum shift key. Okay. So, basically, it's a, it uses a symbol scheme with memory. So let's look at the partial response CPM. Uh, what are the interesting properties of it? 
we'll see in the later slides. So the duration of the pulse is LT, but the area is still the same at one half. If we still have H is rational, by extending the pulse duration, we actually have, or rather, we actually create more memory in our system. We increase the memory by a factor of m raised to l minus 1, where m is the number of uh, symbols in our constellation and l is the length of the pulse. Okay? So, what are the states of your partial response CPM? We can now define a state vector aside from it just being the terminal phase, theta sub n. We can now define the state as theta sub n and the past inputs of our uh, signals or the past inputs on our system. Okay. So, let's uh, break that down. Your phi of t, the current phase is equal to still the same as what we have before. But at time t is equal to nt, let's break this down. Your theta sub n, which is called the accumulation again, just to refresh your memory, it's the accumulation of your uh, past inputs. That means it's already the inputs which have uh, which have a pulse that has ended its transition. Basically, it's already in this uh, region right here. So it's already in this region right here where beta of t is already constant. So that means if your uh, symbol length is, or your pulse length is L, your theta sub n becomes the sum of the past symbols excluding the past L inputs. Okay? So basically your theta sub n becomes this expression right here times 2 pi h of course. The accumulation of the past symbols except for the recent L symbols. Okay? You exclude the recent L symbols in the calculation of this phase state. Now this is uh, what we call, or sorry, this is your current state right, defined by the current L symbols. Okay? So I hope that is clear. Alright, so uh, of course we can actually visualize that using some example. With uh, h equals one half, this is your CPFSK, still binary, but in this case, let's say that the pulse is two rec, or a rectangular pulse that has a uh, length of two t. First, let's define the states. Since the since l is two, then we have a memory uh, memory factor added, so that's. Uh, is a, if h is one half, initially we have four states, but uh, the past symbol also defines the state. Therefore, we need to consider the case when the past symbol is plus one or the past symbol is minus one. Okay, so that would mean we are going to end up with eight states. So recall that for binary CPFSK, the initial four states or phase states are 0.5 pi, 0 pi, and 1.5 pi. If we're going to consider the past input plus 1 minus 1, that would be, that would mean that the 0, 0 0.5 pi, pi, and 1.5 pi will be accompanied by a plus 1 or a minus 1. So this is the definition of the states. We have eight states. So if you want to solve for the state diagram, we need to know how we how the uh, system behaves. 
So we are going to use a table to solve for this. And these are the important parameters that needs to be tracked. Okay? So we are going to use a table for that. So I'm just going to put the formulas here so that we can track everything. All right. So consider the case when the current input is negative 1 and the past output is negative 1 to positive 1 and we have a different uh, different phase states. All right? So if we have the past input is negative 1, your current uh, phase is 0, Note that the next phase state is equal to theta sub n plus pi over 2 a sub n minus 1. So this is the, the next state will be 0 plus pi over 2 times negative 1, which is 1.5 pi. Okay. So that would mean that your uh, state transitions from 0 negative 1 to 1 1.5 negative 1. This negative 1 is because of the current input negative 1. Okay. So you do all that with different with all the different cases right here. And you will see how the state transitions depending on the input. Okay. And this is just the table for when the input is negative 1. And we also have a table for when the input is positive 1. So what is our state diagram? So you're, from your state 1, if your input is positive 1, then you transition to state 2. If your input is negative 1, you transition to state 6. From 2, if your input is positive 1, okay, you transition to state 3. Okay, so you can look at that here, actually. So you're going to have to go back to the definition of your states. If your input is plus 1 and you're initially at state 1, which is 0, negative 1, right? No, sorry. Zero, it should be 0, positive 1. There you go. If your input is positive 1, so that's 0, positive 1. If your input is positive 1, you'll go into this state, 0 0.5, positive 1, which is... 0 0.5 positive 1 is state 2. Okay? And you do that for all different cases. And you'll be able to form your state diagram. Okay? So that's how you un, uh, make do with the information that you have. Okay, another example. Now we have a quaternary CPM. That means we have a symbol, uh, four symbols. So your symbols would be negative 3, negative 1, positive 1, and positive 3. Let the modulation index be 2 over 3. And the length of your pulse is just 1. So the number of states here is equal to 3. So define first the states. And we have these three states right here. So again, we'll use a table to solve for the state diagram. So how many different cases do we have? So we have uh, four cases with the input, uh, <clears throat> four cases with the input, and then three cases with the uh, states. That would be that would mean we have twelve different possible cases. So that's three times four, summarized by this table right here. All right. So if the input is negative three, your past, uh, your current rather current terminal state is zero. The input is negative 3, then your uh, next state is also 0. So where did this come from? Again, theta sub n plus 1 is equal to theta sub n plus a sub k times pi h. Okay? So this is negative 3, where h is 2 thirds, that would mean your theta sub n becomes plus negative 3 times 2 pi over 3. Or basically, that's just minus 2 pi. We'll just end up where we came from. 
Okay? And the state transition would be S sub n is defined by theta n. S sub n plus 1 is defined by theta n plus 1. The state will just transition with itself. Okay? And you do that for all these different rows. Okay? For all the different cases right there. Alright? And from here, you can see the state transition diagram. So we have three states, and we have four possible inputs. That should mean that there are, uh, there are four lines that are going out of your state. Okay? That's how you know, that's how you check when your state diagram is correct. All right. So if the input is positive 3 or negative 3, you can see that the straight, sorry, the state transitions with itself. If it's plus one or minus one, it will transition to your uh, to a different state rather. So if you can see this, if the input is continuously positive one, your states will just transition in this direction. If it's negative one, your state will transition in this direction. So that is all for this example. And that is actually all for this, for the digital modulation with memory. So these are all the preliminaries. Uh, if you have, of course, if you have modulation, you need to be able to demodulate that. So how do we reverse the process from your digital modulation to your uh, decoding and we can recover our bits? Okay, so basically we'll start from our uh, memoryless digital modulation. How do we detect them? And then we also uh, look at our modulation with memory. So that's the end of this lecture. If you have any questions or comments or you, do you need clarifications on something, just uh, post a comment in the comment section below. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next lecture. Bye.